So, if I may start by insulting your intelligence with what is called the most elementary lesson. The thing that we should have learned before we learned one, two, three, and A, B, C, that somehow was overlooked. Now, this lesson is quite simply this, that any experience that we have through our senses, whether of sound or of light or of touch, is a vibration. And a vibration has two aspects, one called on and the other called off. Vibration is, seems to be propagated in waves and every wave system has crests and it has troughs. And so life is a system of now you see it, now you don't. And these two aspects always go together. For example, sound is not pure sound. It is a rapid alternation of sound and silence. And that's simply the way things are. Only you must remember that the crest and the trough of a wave are inseparable. Nobody ever saw crests without troughs or troughs without crests, just as you don't encounter in life people with fronts but no backs. Just as you don't encounter a coin that has the heads but no tails. And although the heads and the tails the fronts and the backs, the positives and the negatives are different. They're at the same time one. And one has to get used fundamentally to the notion that different things can be inseparable. That what is explicitly two can at the same time be implicitly one. If you forget that, very funny things happen. If therefore we forget, you see, that black and white are inseparable and that existence is constituted equivalently by being and non-being, then we get scared. And we have to play a game called, uh-oh, black might win. And once we get into the fear that black, the negative side, might win, we are compelled to play the game, but white must win. And from that start all our troubles. Because you see, the human awareness is a very odd mechanism. That is to say, we have as a species specialized in a certain kind of awareness, which we call conscious attention. And by this, we have the faculty of examining the details of life very closely. We can restrict our gaze, and it corresponds somewhat to the peripheral field, I mean the, the central field of vision in the eyes. We have central vision, we have peripheral vision. Central vision is that which we use for reading, for all sorts of close work, and it's like using a spotlight, whereas peripheral vision is more like using a floodlight. Now, civilization and civilized human beings for maybe 5,000 years, maybe much longer, have learned to specialize in concentrated attention. Even if a person's attention span is short, he is, as it were, wavering his spotlight over many fields. The price which we pay for specialization in conscious attention is ignorance of everything outside its field. I would rather say ignorance than ignorance, because if you concentrate on a figure, you tend to ignore the background. You tend, therefore, to see the world in a disintegrated aspect. You take separate things and events seriously imagining that these really do exist when actually they have the same kind of existence as an individual's interpretation of a Rorschach blot. They're what you make out of it. In fact, our physical world is a system of inseparable differences. Everything exists with everything else. 
but we contrive not to notice that because what we notice is what is noteworthy and we notice it in terms of notations numbers words images what is notable noteworthy notated noticed is what appears to us to be significant and the rest is ignored as insignificant and as a result of that we select from the total input that goes to our senses only a very small fraction and this causes us to believe that we are separate beings isolated by the boundary of the epidermis from the rest of the world you see this is also the mechanism involved in not noticing that black and white go together not noticing that every inside has an outside and that the inside what's inside goes on inside your skin is inseparable from what goes on outside your skin you see that uh for example in the science of ecology one learns that a human being is not an organism in an environment but is an organism hyphen environment that is to say a unified field of behavior if you describe carefully the behavior of any organism you cannot do so without at the same time describing the behavior of the environment and by that you know that you've got a new entity of study the organism is not the puppet of the environment being pushed around by it nor on the other hand is the environment the puppet of the organism being pushed around by the organism the relationship between them is to use john dewey's word transactional a transaction being a situation like buying and selling in which there is no buying unless somebody sells and no selling unless somebody buys now when you go deeply into the nature of selfishness what do you discover you say i love myself i seek my own advantage now what is the self that i love what do i want and that becomes an increasingly ever deepening puzzle now i've often referred to this when you say to somebody else i love you it's always rather disconcerting to the person to whom you say that if you imply that you love them with a pure disinterested and holy love they automatically suspect it as being a little bit phony but if you say i love you so much i could eat you that's an expression as a way of saying to a person you attract me so much that i can't help it i'm absolutely bowled over by you i'm gone and people like that then they feel they're really being loved that it's absolutely genuine but now i love you so much i could eat you now what the devil do i want i certainly don't want to eat the girl in the sense of literally devouring her because then she'd disappear <laughs> ah but i love myself and what is me how do in what way do i know me when it suddenly occurs to me that i know me only in terms of you and that the main task of the psychotherapist is to do what he called to integrate the evil to as it were put the devil in us in its proper function because you see it's always the devil the unacknowledged one the outcast the scapegoat the bastard the bad guy you see the black sheep of the family 
it's always from that point that generation comes. In other words, uh, in the same way as in the drama, uh, to have the play, it's necessary to introduce a villain. It's necessary to introduce a certain element of trouble. So in the whole scheme of life, there has to be the shadow. Because without the shadow, there can't be the substance. So this is why there is a very strange association between crime and all naughty things and holiness. You see, holiness is way beyond being good. Good people aren't necessarily holy people. A holy person is one who is whole, who has, as it were, reconciled his opposites. And so there's always something slightly scary about holy people. And other people react to them in very strange ways. They can't make up their minds whether they're saints or devils. And so holy people have throughout history always created a great deal of trouble along with their creative results. Let's take Jesus, for example. Trouble that Jesus created is absolutely incalculable. <laughs> think of the Crusades, the Inquisition, the heaven only knows what's gone on in the name of Jesus. Very remarkable. Freud's a big troublemaker. Jung had a tremendous humor. And he knew that nobody can be completely honest. That you will try and you'll have a great deal of success in uh, exploring your motivations and your dark, unconscious depths. But there will be a certain point at which you will say, well, I've had enough of that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Do you see how, in a strange way, there's a certain sanity in that? When a person indulges in a certain kind of duplicity, of deception, there is something, you all laughed when I said that, there was something humorous about it. And this humor is a very funny thing. Basically humor is an attitude of laughter about oneself. There is malicious humor, or, which is laughing at other people. But real deep humor is laughter at oneself. Now why fundamentally do you laugh about yourself? What makes you laugh about yourself? Isn't it because you know that there is a big difference between what goes on the outside and what goes on the inside? <laughs> now I passed you around a lot of embroidery to look at before we started. And I'm perfectly sure that you got the point that there's a big difference between the front and the back. <coughs> In some forms of embroidery, the back is very different from the front because people take shortcuts. In the front, everything is orderly and it is supposed to be kind of messy on the back side. See, which side will you wear? You've got to be sure you get the front in the front and have the back in the back. The back has all the little tricks in it, all the shortcuts, all the lowdown that people don't acknowledge, see? And it's exactly the same with the way we live. You know, like sweeping the dust under the carpet in a hurry just before the guests come. I mean, we do ever so many things like that. And if you don't do it, if you don't think you do it, and you think, well, really, I, my embroidery is the same on both sides, see? Well, you're deceiving yourself. Because what you're doing is you're taking the shortcuts in another dimension, which you're keeping out of consciousness. Everybody takes the shortcuts. Everybody plays tricks. Everybody has in himself an element of duplicity, of deception. Because you see, from this point of view that I'm discussing, where the web is the trap, to be is to deceive. Think of camouflage, the chameleon who changes its color. Think of the butterfly pretending it has eyes Think of the flower, 
saying to the bee, like my honey? <laughs> bee says, wow. <laughs> but then that means that the bee has to be, and it has to go on living, and all the trouble it takes to go around collecting honey and raising other bees and organizing itself and doing that dance which tells the other bees where there's more honey. There's all that stuff to do. But the flower was deceptive. Now, in the same way, I've often said, life is, is a drama, and a drama is a deception. It's a big act. When you peel an onion and you don't really understand the nature of an onion, you might look for the pit in the center, like any ordinary fruit has. But the onion doesn't have a center. It's all skins. So when you get right down, there's nothing but a bunch of skins. You say, well, that was a kind of disappointing. <laughs> well, in rather the same way, you see, you find when you explore yourself uh, and your motivations and you go through and through and you try to find out that thing which is really genuine. So you explore the onion and you go in and in and in and then you find, well, uh, it's all a deception. Now then the question arises, who's deceiving who? Who's fooling who? I'm fooling me? What is fooling? Fooling is playing like you're there when you're not. You know, getting somebody else to answer your name in the roll call. <laughs> so, we're all, you see, this is the metaphysical basis of it. This is what the Hindus mean by maya, the world illusion. The world is playing it's there when it isn't. And it's a trap. And it sucks you in. And you can't get out of it. And it's a thorough big trap too. But always when you get an idea like this or a feeling like this, follow it to its extreme. Don't back out from it. If you find you're selfish, go to the extreme of what selfishness means. Confusion largely results from not following feelings or ideas to their depth. You know, people think they want to be immortal. They'd like to live forever. Do you really want to do that? Think about it. Really go into it, what it would be like. People say they want this, that, and the other. They want this kind of car, they want this kind of dress, or so on, and um, this much money, and so on. It's always a good idea to think it right through. What it would involve to be in that situation, to have those desires fulfilled. Also, when you form a relationship to another person, think it through, too. You see? How inconvenient would they be? <laughs> however attractive and uh, always turn the em embroidery round and look at the underside but don't get caught doing it <laughs> see that's something one does on the side in secret because otherwise you play the game that everything is as it's supposed to be on the front but that makes you humorous and that makes you human <laughs>